Live from the BDN Studios, it's Bang and Dang. That's awesome. If you don't like that, then... You ain't black. Welcome back to Outlaws of Gunslingers Mafia Edition with your host, Bang and Dang. And we are... Back in the saddle again. <laughs> yes, we are, but we're also at... Pretty much the end of the line of the Genovese family profiling people. I think this episode will profile three of the last main head big bosses. And then next episode, we'll take a look at uh, some of the other guys that don't have much of a story. Maybe uh, take a look, quick look at a couple of people, plus their current leadership and a uh, few people who actually turn state's evidence against them, and then we'll wrap that up next week and get, head into, I think it was, the Lucchese family is the second oldest family after the Genovese family, so we'll probably start out with them. And I think the Lucchese family is the, I think their most notable thing is the uh, the Lufthansa Luftan- Airport heist with Henry Hill and all those from Goodfellas and all that good stuff, you know. Want to talk about airport heist? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll take a look at those guys next. And uh, yeah, so we got. Did he die recently? Who? Henry Hill? Yeah. yeah I believe so. Uh, we got today's episode Matthew, Maddie the Horse, Ionello, Daniel, Danny the Lion, Leo, and some say the current boss of the family, Laborio Salvatore Belomo. That's Belomo. <laughs> uh, as you can see, three. Three more guys this episode, because like we've said before, these guys, literally these newer guys, too. Yeah, you can find They have on nothing on these guys. Uh, this Genovese family is, like, secretive as shit. Unless you dig in and, like, find newspaper articles from somewhere. I don't know. I tried. All the newspaper articles say the same thing. You might, I think, this Maddie the horse I was able to stretch out into something from a newspaper article other than that especially uh this danny the leo guy and uh the new guy belomo nothing they're not even sure that belomo's even the the head guy now probably not um i don't know how they like to uh deceive everybody with that we got the first guy up matthew joseph ionello aka maddie the horse Maddie the Horse was a New York mobster obviously ionello uh he was once the acting boss of the genovese crime family Born in 1920 in Little Italy, Manhattan, and was one of eight children of his Italian immigrant parents. He allegedly got his nickname, Matty the Horse, in a youth baseball game, during which one of those games got things got out of control when the pitcher of the opposite team was annoying Matty's team, teammate who was about to bat. To make things worse, he threw the ball as hard as he could in the face of the batter. Oh, shit. A fight erupted in which Maddie knocked down the pitcher, who was at least three years older and about two heads taller than himself. Two heads. After this, his teammates and several local mobsters said, that boy is as strong as a horse. Huh, ain't that beautiful. He worked as a waiter in a restaurant owned by his uncle in Brooklyn, and then and that was in the dockyards. And then as a longshoreman in Brooklyn Navy Yard. And then joined the United States Army in 1943. Received a Purple Heart and a Brown Star for Valor in combat. In the Asiatic Pacific Theater, after World War Dos, he and an, he and an uncle became partners in the second restaurant, Maddie's Town Crest Restaurant. They call it. Agnello was married to Beatrice May, and the couple had four beautiful, beautiful children. Beatrice, Beatrice. It's fifty-one. He was arrested on charges of possessing heroin, but the charges were dropped. Nineteen sixty, he became partners with Edward L. De Curtis was a longtime associate and running private after-hours drinking clubs for gay men. Oh, shit. Ionello eventually owned a string of clubs and nightclubs for gay men, including the Gilded Grape and the Haymarket. Dude, Mafia didn't like gays. What the hell is going on? Well, it's making him money. Is he gay? I don't know. He's got a wife. Mm. In the 1960s, he joined the Genovese crime family. See, this was before then. Uh, then run by imprisoned boss Vito Genovese. Ionello's sponsor was mobster and future acting boss Frank Thierry, who has nothing on that guy, by the way. Yeah, good luck. Agnello eventually controlled Amalgamated Transit Union, which is Butch Driver's local 1181, giving him the power to extort payments from the school bus companies in New York City, as well as the union drivers. Good for him. 2nd of February, 1965, Agnello, Agnello was indicted on the contempt of grand jury charges for refusal to testify. Look at him. However, the charges were dismissed in 1966. 
in early 1970s, Agnello was promoted to Capo Regime. Agnello then controlled over 80 restaurants, sex-orientated clubs all around New York City area, including most of those located in Times Square. That's, that's in, in Manhattan. That's in the 70s, too. The ship was popping Ooh, in New York back then. We Officially, he still had a respectable job with the union. The oh, Brim. The Brim. 1972, the Colombo crime family rebel Joe Gallo was yep. murdered at the restaurant Umberto's Clam House in Little Italy, owned by Matthew's father, Umberto Ainello. April 7, 1972, morning, uh, the morning, most places were closed when Gallo and his entourage, among them his bodyguard Peter the Greek Diapolos, were hungry and looking for a restaurant. But they were. Umberto's hadn't been open that long, and none of them had ever eaten there. When he entered the restaurant, Gallo greeted Maddie, whom he knew to be a Genovese capo. But he wasn't aware that Maddie's brother was the owner, or I thought I said father, but nor that Maddie was a silent partner in this restaurant. Okay. Not long after the group sat down for dinner, three armed men stormed into the restaurant. They were gunning for Joe Gallo, and they opened fire. Because he was standing and walking away from the table, he protected the group. Among them, his sister and stepdaughter, from getting moited. Joe Gallo was hit several times, collapsed, and dies. Pete the Greek tried to shoot the hitman, but got hit in the butt. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Shot me. When he got back up after seeing the shooters drive off in a car, obviously, they all jumped on a motorcycle <laughs> well, on each other's shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> like a uh, circus act and shit. <laughs> Uh, he confronted Maddie, who was in the kitchen in the time of the hit. Maddie convinces Pete the Greek that he had nothing to do with the hit and that he is part owner of the restaurant. Why would I want to do that in my own restaurant? You know, that uh, shit yeah. is frowned upon. The Greek realizes Gallo had uh, a lot more enemies and, and takes Matt, Maddie's void oh, for shit. it. To this day, Umbrotos is a tourist attraction. The restaurant has moved from its original location, though. So, so it means nothing. Yeah. 1985, along with Vincent Asaro, he was alleged to have demanded up to a million dollars when CD properties owned by gangster Michael Zaffirano were sold to legitimate real estate developers. Okay, good for him. February 28, 1985, he was then indicted in federal court in New York on charges of racketeering involving the operation of several restaurants, yeah. bars, and carding companies. Everybody was getting indicted in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Using telephone tapping on Nainello's office, agents assembled proof that he was skimming over $2 million from bars and restaurants and a topless bar in which he owned interests. December 30th, 1985, he was convicted on numerous counts. And February 16th, 1986, Judge Weinfeld, or Weinfeld sentenced him to six years in federal prison. Who freaking who? He'll do three, maybe. Well, Willie? 13th of May, 1986. And Yellow was acquitted on all charges on the 86 indictment on racketeering in the garbage industry. 17th of May, 1986. And Yellow was indicted in federal court in New York on new charges of labor racketeering, construction big bid rigging, extortion, gambling, and moida conspiracies. 18th May 1988, Agnello was indicted again in Newark on racketeering charges involving the 1984 Genovese takeover of a gravel company in Edgewater, New Jersey. 13th of October 1988, Agnello was sentenced to 13th. It feels like I'm reading Trump's indictment list. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, Agnello was sentenced to 13 years in a federal prison after being convicted of the 1986 bid rigging racketeering charges. Well, damn. Only, uh, Seven short years later, he was released from prison in 1995. When uh, boss Vincent Gigante went to prison in 97, Ionello became the acting boss. Of course he did. By 98, he was deeply involved in the amalgamated, amalgamated. amalgamated transit union, local 1181. Yes. Through the union, he forced a medical center to pay $100,000 to renew their lease and then make regular cash pay payments in order to keep it. Damn right. Between 2001 and 2005, Ionello received protection fees of more than $800,000 from Connecticut Waste Management businesses Damn. owned by James Galante. On July 27, 2005, he was again indicted on racketeering charges in New York involving extortion and loan sharking. Of course he was. Well, the federal agents that arrested Agnello at his home reported that he was watching the film Godfather Part 3, the worst one of all. All right. <laughs> uh, on June 10th, 2006, Agnello was indicted in federal court in New Haven on charges of racketeering involving trash hauling. <laughs> what kind of person gets uh, indicted for trash? The mob. All right. This was in southwestern Connecticut. He pled guilty to the New York racketeering charges and received an 18-month prison sentence. And he pleaded guilty in Connecticut, was sentenced to two years in federal prison to run concurrent with the 18-month New York sentence. So you do 
eight months. And Yellow's attorney had asked for leniency, saying and Yellow had cancer and it wasn't general it was poor health. April third, two thousand nine, after serving two years, and Yellow was released from the Federal Medical Center in Butner. Okay, well, August 15, 2012, he died at his home in Old Westbury, New York, of health problems related to heart ailments and other illnesses, including prostate cancers. Ooh. Uh, Matthew Ionello was portrayed by actor Gary Pastore in the 2017 HBO series The Deuce. I gotta finish that. I watched the I first watched couple, a couple episodes. episodes, but I mean, whatever. There's like two seasons in there. Yeah. What's that? Uh, What's his Franco. name? Franco Jamie. James. Was it? True story. Of course. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was old Maddie Dice. <laughs> Maddie Ice. Maddie Ice Agnello. Maddie the horse. Maddie the horse. Agnello. <laughs> Next guy. Oh, Danny. Danny the Lion. Daniel Leo. He was born 16th January 1928 in East Harlem. He's the former acting boss of Genovese crime family, supposedly. Leo was once a member of the notorious East Harlem Purple Gang in the 1970s. Really? Are they affiliated with Detroit? No, because they're Detroit's black. Purple, Detroit's Purple Gang long gone. Black, though, right? Uh, the Purple Gang, yeah. No, no. They were like Jews or something, right? Yeah. Are these guys Jews? Italian nope. American hitman. Oh, shit. Well, they, uh... Oh, no. Yeah, they uh, named their group the Pur- Purple Gang as a tribute to the Prohibition era Purple Gang, which was... Uh, yeah, black guy. Jewish Americans, that's right. He's also known as Daniel Leonetti and Daniel Leonardo. The FBI, the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Prisons recorded his name as Danny Leo. Either way, right? Mm. Neto or Nardo. Leo resides in a luxurious manor in Rockleigh, New Jersey. And he was suspected of drug trafficking during his earlier years as a soldier in the Genovese family. 13th of June, 1980. He was indicted. Look at how old this dude was born in 28. We have nothing on him until right. 80. Right. Leo was indicted for refusing to answer grand jury questions in regards to the moida of an 18-year-old Maurice Anzizi. Anzizi. Anzizi and his girlfriend were moited in 1978 in the Bronx. Oh. <laughs> All right. Leo was once president of a construction company named Elite Ready Mix. Hmm. Allegedly promoted to captain under the regime of Vincent the Chin Gigante. In the late 80s or early 90s, after living a low-profile life, low life as a faction leader, he held a high position in the family with Gigante's top associates, Quiet Dom Cirillo, did. Little Jimmy Ida, and Louis Bobby Manna. We did one of them. 2005, Leo became the acting boss of the Genovese crime family after uh, Ionello went to prison. Look at that shit. This is from a New York Post article on the 1st of December, 2006. A low-key Genovese leader who spent decades flying below the Fed's radar had succeeded the late Vincent the Chin Gigante as head of the Mafia's strongest crime family. It was charged yesterday. Daniel Leo, 65, lives in a secluded $2 million home in historic Rockleigh, New Jersey, one of the most expensive towns in the state. While secretly holding the reins of the Genovese crime family, this is what the Fed said. The gangster's reputed rise becomes less than a year after the death of the legendary odd father Gigante. Everybody knows about that guy. Walking around peeing on the freaking right. lampposts and shit. Uh, he gained the court notoriety for feigning mental illness to throw off the probers. Oh, Gigante <laughs> did. Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Eric Snyder identified Leo as the family boss and implicated him in two violent extortion schemes during an arraignment for the reputed mob uh, Biggs burly right-hand man. Okay. Snyder told Manhattan Federal Magistrate Ronald Ellis that Leo is boss of the Genovese crime family, the most organized, most powerful, largest organized crime family existing today. Well, the prosecutor said Leo and reputed wise guy Charles Salvano teamed up to shake down an East Harlem gambling operation for twenty thousand and tried to extort two hundred fifty thousand from a taxi company. Hmm. Um, from a taxi company owner threatened to put him in a wheelchair if he didn't pay. Oh, he's lucky. A wheelchair could have been in the, in the swimming with the fishy. Right. Say. Savannah was arrested yesterday and held overnight while the judge considers whether to set bail. Leo, who has eluded arrest since 1980, has not been charged in the case. The reputed Don's wife, Teresa, refused to speak to a reporter at the couple's two-story brick Georgian style house, which sits on a quiet Rockley Road, just 406 feet from a municipal building. Damn. The house is the mayor's office and a police substation. Oh, shit. Jeez. I mean, I guess that's where I would put my right. house right next to the cop's place. 
Neighbors seem surprised to hear about Leo's alleged position as mob boss yesterday, describing him and his wife as a quiet couple. You don't really hear too much from them. All right. They've lived here for a long time. I've never seen a lot of traffic in and out, but I suppose that if you wanted to keep a low pri- profile, this is a good place to do it, one neighbor said. A local who has known Leo's family for many years said, I always knew he was connected, but I didn't know he was that well connected. Mm-hmm. You didn't know he was <laughs> deconnected. Right. <laughs> Leo's only arrest was for contempt of court in 1980 when he refused to testify, yes. Right. Property records show Leo also owns a condo in Boca Raton, because they all do, and once held the title of president at a company called Elite Ready Mix. Fantastic. May 2007. Leo was one in, one of many Genovese crime family members indicted on federal loan shark and extortion charges. Early 2008, he pled guilty to racketeering and loan sharking, sentenced to five years in prison. Projected release date, October 7, 2011. But January 10, 2010, he pled guilty to racketeering charges and faced up to 40 years in prison. March 2010, he was sentenced to an additional 18 months in prison and fined $1.3 million. He began serving his time at the low security facility at Federal Correctional Complex in Coleman, that's in Florida, but was subsequently released into community corrections in Miami. He was released from federal custody on January 25th, 2013. Good for him. And still alive, and who knows what he's doing now because there's nothing else on this guy. Apparently uh, not in the mob anymore. He's still, you know, he's in the mob. He's collecting his monthly payments uh, for doing nothing. Well, who knows? Um, this dude's like almost a hundred years old, so I don't think he's doing too much. Right. This brings us to Laborio Salvatore Balomo, who many think is the current acting boss of the family. He was born January eighth, nineteen fifty seven. He's boss of the family. <laughs> Balomo is the son of Salvatore Balomo. He is the double cousin of Genovese associate Laborio. Thomas Belomo. Their fathers are brothers and their mothers are sisters. What? Fantastic. We got a lot of those. All right. This has led law enforcement to confuse their identities on several occasions. 1997, Laborio Thomas Belomo swore an affidavit that he was guilty of federal charges instead of Belomo. The other Belomo, I guess? But he was also confused with... The other guy. His All right. So he swore in an affidavit that he was guilty of federal charges instead of the other Belomo, I guess. Salvatore Belomo was a soldier and close to uh, Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. Belomo was initiated in 1977, so his daddy was in the business too. Huh? Oh my gosh, shit. 1990, Kenneth McCabe, then organized crime investigator for the United States Attorney's Office in Manhattan. He identified Belomo as acting boss of the crime family following the indictment of Vincent the Chang Gigante. This was in, called the Windows Case. Yes. June 11th, 1996, Belomo was indicted on Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, which is the RICO Act. The RICO charges. Everybody knew Tony Sprown was so scared of RICO. (laughs) (laughs) Including the moitas of mobster Ralph De Simone and Antonio De Lizarenzo. Uh, He had extortion and labor racketeering. Damn. uh, De Lorenzo was found shot to death. In the backyard of his house in West New York in New Jersey. All right. Well, De Simone was found in the trunk of his car at LaGuardia Airport in Queens, shot five times. Oh, it would be West New York in New Jersey. New Jersey's mm-hmm. east of New York. Shit happens, man. <laughs> Both De Simone and De Lorenzo were murdered because the Genovese leadership thought they were government informants. Well, of course they did. Belomo's lawyer stated that the client passed two polygraph tests in which he denied killing anybody. FBI agent shaved Belomo's head looking for evidence that Belomo had used lithium to beat the polygraph machines. Oh, jeez. No shit. What was that? Oh. What was that? The old, uh... Maybe like lithium throws off the... The old penny in, in your mouth? Something like that, right? Well, that's for drug tests or something, isn't it? Oh, maybe. The alcohol or something. February 1997, prosecutors dropped the De Simone and De Lorenzo murder charges and offered Belomo a chance to plead guilty to extorting payoffs from a construction union. And a garbage hauling company. He accepted the deal and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. July 13, 2001. Belamo was indicted again on money laundering while it's still in prison. This was related to the Genovese family's involvement in the waterfront rackets and control of the ILA. Belamo was accused of hiding money stolen from the ILA's members' pension funds. Oh, no. Uh, this was between 1996 and 1997. Well, Belomo again pleaded guilty to lesser charges, pushing back his scheduled release date to 2004. February 26, 2000, uh, February 23rd, 2006, Belomo and over 30 Genovese fam, uh, family members were indicted on more racketeering charges. 
Paloma was specifically charged with ordering the 1998 murder of Ralph Coppola, Uh-oh. the acting Coppola. Is that the Coppola? Francis Ford's people's right. Right. and uh, Nicholas Cage's people's. Right. The acting captain of Belomo's crew and Belomo's good friend as well. September 16th, 1998, Coppola disappeared a few weeks before sentencing on fraud charges and was never found. Of course not. Government witness Peter Peluso, a former lawyer for the Genovese family, stated that he had transported a message from Belomo while he was in prison ordering Coppola's murder. Hmm. Some accounts say that Coppola was disrespectful. Others say that he was stealing family profits. Either or, he did. Right. He got dealt with. Labrario S. Bellamo, a.k.a. This is from his indictment. Yeah. Uh, A.k.a. Barney Bellamo, the defendant was at various times relevant to this indictment. A soldier, capo, acting boss of the Genovese Organized Crime Family. Prior to becoming acting boss of the Genovese Organized Crime Family in or about 1992, Bellamo was first a a soldier (laughs) in the Genovese Crime Family and then a powerful capo who controlled a crew of soldiers and associates based in the Bronx, New York. Bellamo was responsible for, (laughs) amongst other things... Control over labor union associated with the Jacob Javits Convention Center in Manhattan. Dude, everybody's associated with the Jacob Javits Convention Center. Well, Bellamo, or Belomo, I don't know how you say his last name, became acting boss of the family in about 1992, following the incarceration, yes we know, in about 96, Belomo himself was incarcerated after being arrested. Following his incarceration and even after being replaced as acting boss, Bellomo retained significant power and authority within the crime family, and he continued to be consulted on and make decisions with respect to the family's criminal activities. In or about 1997, following his conviction on federal extortion charges, Bellomo was sentenced to a term of 10 years imprisonment. Bellomo's criminal activities included 1998 murder of Ralph Cop- Coppola, Genovese family soldier and acting capo. Capo. As well as his participation in two schemes to obstruct justice. One, by conspiring to tamper with a potential witness. And the other, by giving false and misleading testimony in the grand jury proceeding. Can't do that, bud. You can't do that. No, no. No, 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 no. Well, Peluso pleaded guilty to his role in that murder. However, the government had no proof that Peluso had indeed met with Blomo. With insufficient evidence to press the murder charge against him, the government offered him a plea bargain for mail fraud in 2007. Palomo accepted and received one additional year in prison instead of four, and his daughter Sabrina gave a tearful plea to Judge Louis A. Kaplan alongside her three brothers. Due to his imprisonment, he missed her high school, college, and law, law school graduations. Aww. <laughs> December 1st, 2008, Palomo was released from prison. He is believed to have taken over boss at this time. However, the feds only officially recognized him as boss in 2016. <laughs> to where it took him eight years. He remains to this day. Yeah, and that's I told you guys. There's nothing here with these guys at all. Nothing you can do about at it. all, man. Unless you like actually do digging, 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 like hours. There's no digging. Or you can dig. You can go into the. City records of New York and all that shit, or whatever cities they lived in, they find all kinds of shit, but who the frick wants to do that? Like what? I don't know anything. Like everything we just said? What else would they have? Oh, we bought a house. Maybe more. That's stupid. All right. We're going to do that dumb shit. Yeah, that'll do it for us this week as we covered the final three bosses and uh, the current boss as well of this uh, family. Next week, we'll cover the rest of the Genovese family who... Were there, but they weren't. Mm-hmm. Nothing big. We got Anthony Fat, Tony Salerno. He was underboss, front boss. And we got uh, Daniel Pagano, who was a capo. We got Frankie Thierry, who they say was a front or uh, a- acting boss, but he never was. I don't yeah. know why they say that in here. That's stupid. Um, Venero Mangano, he was a capo. Savio Santara, John Barbado, bunch of capos and shit. Anthony Tough Guy Federici. Tough Tony. Tough Tony, Tough Guy. <laughs> Federici. Federici. And then we'll take a look at a couple of the, uh, the current leaderships, which there's a lot because they got a lot of factions. Yeah, we just. Yeah. And then we'll take a look at some government informants, the most notable, which is Joseph Velashi. Which we'll have our own episode on him, so we won't get too much into him. But there's a few more guys that also were not only for Genovese, they ratted out all the families. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah. I don't even know how Genovese is even around. Same how uh, the other ones are still around. It's the mob, baby. Actually, I don't know how the um, the Colombo or whatever. The other one. Which one? That did what? What is it? The Lucchese, Genovese. Colombo, Gambino. Gambino. The Gambino is one with all the informants and uh, the leakers and stuff. Well, Gambino was the one that Gotti ran. So, yeah. Yeah. You're thinking of the Colombo. Yeah, the Colombo. The Colombo is the one that uh, Donnie Brasco infiltrated. So. Mm, Donnie Brasco. Yeah. And then. What, uh, uh, White Boy Rick and all that. When we do that? Uh, because it wasn't in the mob, yeah. Of course it is. Mm, Organized no. crime. It was part of the mob. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, if the mob is the FBI. Huh? If the mob is the FBI. He was still part of the mob. Oh, he wasn't. What about. Uh, I don't know. George Young. He wasn't with the mob at all. Huh? Wasn't with the mob at it all. It was with the Colombian drug cartel. Hey, okay, this is America. It's the same thing. This is America. America, damn it. This is the uh, t- American mafia, so, not the uh, Colombian cartels. I mean, we could still use it. Do yeah, those. I don't think so. Joe maybe was, maybe down the line, but not when uh, the American mafia episodes. No, no, no. That's going to do it for us in this episode. We'll wrap up the Genovese crime family next week and move into the Lucchese family. Which part? Of, which ones? Which mob families was on involved with uh, Jeff K and Marilyn Monroe? All of them. All of them? I don't know. All the families? I don't think there was an official one. I think they all got together, didn't they? It was like a... They were all, like, approached to right. take out fucking Fidel and shit, too. That's true. So, um, yeah. With that, we'll check out the rest of the family next week, and that'll do it for us. Go uh, check out our other podcast, according to Wikipedia, where this week's episode is going to be all about the uh, Napoleonic Wars. Oh, jeez. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we spent a good hour and 45 minutes on that uh, article on Wikipedia, if you don't know what that is. There's about a good... Well, the first part was decent. Yeah, I mean... And then the end of it kind of fizzled out. Right. It's all the same stuff. Mm. If you don't know what according to Wikipedia is, we take uh, random Wikipedia articles, literally random, because we've already done one on the Hobbit book, we've done one on sexual intercourse, climate change, and, and just random... Uh, Spin a wheel on whatever random page it lands on we read. So this week was the Napoleonic Wars. And, and I think next, next week? week we're going to be reading about the dodo bird. Hell so yeah, the old dodo. <laughs> yeah, it's random Wikipedia stuff. Uh, so cool. We read them so you don't have to. It might be a little entertaining to some of you guys. And supposedly it's related to the pigeon. The pigeon, yeah. The pigeon. Um, and then uh, Battles of the American Civil War. We're in the middle of 1863 and we're about to reach the Battle of Chickamauga. But how is it related to the pigeon when it's a, uh, a fantasy bird? The dodo wasn't a fantasy yeah. bird. Yeah, it was a mythical, mythological creature. No. Yeah. No, that was the Kansas Jayhawk. You're getting, you you're, sure? get, you're getting episodes mixed no, up. I think by, it was the dodo. No, it was the Kansas. Yeah. It was the Jayhawk. No, it was the dodo. Yeah, it was the Jayhawk. The dodo. Yeah, the Jayhawk was the dodo. Mythical. They had skulls and shit. Is it, yes. The they mix those two up again. <laughs> yes. And Damn. Uh, we yeah. should do the Jayhawk. Oh, well, well, if it lands <laughs> on it, yes. <laughs> uh, Battles of the American Civil War. Go check us out on Bang Dang Network on YouTube. Give us a like, subscribe, share, do all that good stuff. Review, and we'll be back next week for more Outlaws and Gunslingers Mafia. Ooh. We are the Mother Michiganders with it's a bang a dang. <laughs>